Well, we're so excited that you joined us today on our online campus. Even though we believe there's no replacement for the fellowship of the body, we understand that there are circumstances that might keep you from being with us at one of our physical locations today. We hope you'll consider joining us in person in the future. If you'd like more information on how to be involved in the Ransom Church, that will be available after this teaching time. But for now, just enjoy the message. Well, good morning. We're excited you're here. Whether you're here, actually here at the downtown campus or you're joining us online, uh, we're just glad that you're joining us. I'm going to take a minute here to totally plug the My Ransom initiative. Uh, probably near you is one of these beautiful brochures. Uh, and if you, if you are in this room and you have filled this out, don't do it again. Okay, that's my plug on that. Now, if you're here and you haven't filled this out, uh, this is a great way to identify where you want to be involved, to take ownership of your place in the ransom and in each of our core values, worship free, live free, serve free. Uh, I want to point out one today uh, because uh, you got to see Phil Wiseman on the video. He talked about worship leaders or worship uh, help for the, down, uh, the Harrisburg campus. Um, what I want to do today uh, is encourage you, uh, some of you, if every time that we talk about the Harrisburg campus, there's something inside you that gets excited or feels challenged or you kind of get that stirring in your spirit, uh, you might consider actually checking it out, not as a, a worship team member, but just actually becoming part of that, that congregation. It's a great way to worship and still be here. Um, and if God's stirring you, you might consider doing that. Um, that, that thing is amazing. It's an amazing worship experience. Uh, last Sunday, they had 140 people in worship, which is so awesome. Um, and maybe God's just stirring your heart to be part of, to serve that way. You can check the box that says, I'm feeling the itch to switch, and then write Harrisburg next to it, and we will follow up with you and let you know how you can do that. So that's my plug uh, about Harrisburg, uh, exciting experience to be a part of. So let's jump in. We are in week three of a five-week series called Five Finger Faith. And the goal of this series is to help us figure out how do we grab hold of Scripture? How do we get a grasp of the truth in a way that actually changes our lives? And, and as we've been studying this, uh, actually, as we get started this morning, uh, if, you would just, if you don't have a Bible and you would like to follow along, if you would just raise your hand and the ushers are poised and ready to go to bring you a Bible. If you don't own a Bible, please raise your hand. We want to give you one. It's just our free gift to you because we want you to have God's word in your life. And so as they're passing those out, uh, don't feel afraid to raise your hand and get one. Uh, let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer it out loud. Uh, and it'll take us back to our topic from last week. But how much do you value your Bible? And I don't mean the exact one that you own or a certain translation of the Bible. I mean the fact that you have one. And we live in a country where you can just pick one up anytime that you want. You can just uh, have the Bible available to you uh, at all times. Ha the availability of God's Word is something that in our culture we take for granted. Now, there are places in the world today where owning a Bible will get you killed. That's crazy. There, there are places where you're not allowed to own the Bible and where hiding God's Word in your heart is literally a life and death situation. And as foreign as that is to us, that's actually the norm in our country, or in our world, and it's actually the norm historically. Uh, watch this video uh, from a group of people in China as they receive uh, Bibles that have been smuggled in the country for them. Watch, watch their reaction. Don't really need a translator, do we? You can hear their hearts. And that's the norm for the world. In fact, that's the norm historically for the world. And even in places where you uh, can hear, you're able to hear God's word, you're not allowed to study it for yourself. So let me ask you another silly question. 
what language is your Bible in? And the answer is the one that I know. <laughs> in most countries, in most, and historically, that's not been the case either. They don't have access to God's word in their own language. Now, originally, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in what's called Koine Greek, which means common Greek. In other words, it was written with the intent that it would be put in the hands of everyday, like people could read it. Now, over time, that's changed. Uh, it's been translated, it was translated into German, it was translated into Latin, and if you wanted access to God's Word, you had to be able to speak one of those languages. Uh, for those of us who are English-speaking, it wasn't until 1382 that we had a complete English translation of the New Testament, and then several years later, a complete English translation of the Old Testament, and those were done by a, a man uh, named John Wycliffe. Okay, John Wycliffe translated uh, those, the New Testament and the Old Testament from the Latin into English. Uh, years later, William Tyndale would come along. He would do the first translation from the original Greek and Hebrew into English. And you might think uh, the church was probably thrilled about this. Like now people can study the word for themselves and it would be super great. The reality was quite the opposite. Uh, John Wycliffe was hunted and despised by the church all of his life because of what he was doing. And even though he died a natural death, there's a group of people who, because of what he did, hated him so much that they dug up his bones, burned them, and threw them in the river. Now, William Tyndale didn't do quite as well. Uh, and He was arrested and imprisoned for his crime, and after spending a year in jail for the crime of translating the Bible into the common language, uh, he was sentenced, and he was strangled and burned at the stake. And you might go, why was this such a crime? Why, was it, why did the church do this? And the reality is the church was afraid of you getting a copy of God's word. They were afraid of you having the Bible. Now, before I just like completely throw the church under the bus, their heart was right. They were longing, trying to protect the sacredness of this book. Okay, the sacredness of the word. And, and one of the reasons they didn't want you to have it is they were afraid that people who weren't educated in the scriptures wouldn't be able to understand this fully themselves. And they feared that if everyone had access to the Bible, there are going to be people who interpret this incorrectly and all kinds of weird teachings are going to result. Well, guess what? They were right. In fact, uh, when people handle the word incorrectly, they come up with all kinds of strange ideas. It's happening right now as we speak. I mean, not me, but somewhere, someone is, like, I'm doing a good job here, but, but somewhere, someone is misinterpreting the scripture to meet their own needs. You see what I'm saying? They're, they're mistranslating to justify what they want to be true. And so the church was right to try to protect the sacredness of scripture. But one of the reasons that wasn't so good uh, is they, they feared losing power. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says this, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. This is God's breathed word. We talked about that last week. It's alive and powerful. And if, this is, if we truly believe this is God's inspired word and that this is his message to his people, then this is the most powerful book on earth. And so he who controls this book controls what? The power. So, like, what happens if I take away all the Bibles? What if we, we sent the ushers out and they collected all of your Bibles? And then they went to your house and they took all your Bibles. And they went to all the stores and they took all the Bibles. They even went to the hotels and got the one the Gideon put in the drawer, you know. And there's no Bibles anywhere. The only Bible that's left is this one that I'm holding. And it's no longer in English. Now it's in Latin or some other language that you don't know. But I do know. How powerful does that make me? Right? Because I can begin to tell you things like, um, if you want to follow God, if you want to honor God, you have to sell your house and your car, and you need to give me all the money. You, you need to make my supper and fill my car with gas, and I really like foot massages, and, and you got to do, and you can't argue with me at risk of disobeying God because you, you don't know what it says. You have to try, take my word for it, right? So I become Pinocchio and you're Geppetto, or I'm Geppetto and you're Pinocchio and I hold the strings that control you because with knowledge of God's word, there's incredible power. So fast forward to today. When we started this sermon, what's the first thing I did? I said, if you don't have a Bible, let us do what? Give you one, okay? If you don't own God's word, we're here to make it readily available to you. Some of you own God's word, but you didn't bring it to church. I suppose it was you know, too heavy or whatever. Uh, 
some of you, got, you have it on your phone, but you didn't get your phone out, or you didn't download the app, you don't want to use the data, you know, whatever. Uh, my point being that we all have this access to God's Word. Every single one of us, whether you had a Bible when you walked in the room or not, have access to God's Word. And what's sad is many people pass up the power of the Word and never tap into it, because as we talked about last week, sometimes you don't know the value of something right in front of you. Now, Tyndale, Wycliffe, they knew what this was. They knew the power of this book, and they knew what was at stake because they knew the importance of the ability of people to study and understand and apply the truth to their lives. And they were willing to risk their lives, even sacrifice their lives, so that you and I might be able to study this book. Why? Why why is it so important? Why is it a big deal to study the Bible? Well, let's talk about that. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you are following along in one of our Bibles, it's on page 721. And as you're getting there, uh, Paul wrote two letters to Timothy. One of them, that he was in prison during both of them, uh, in around 66, 67 AD. Uh, one of those he wrote it from kind of like a cushy uh, house arrest type situation. This one, he's actually languishing in a cold dungeon, chained up like a criminal, and knowing that his life is about to end. So he's writing with a little bit of urgency. And, he, and he's wanting Timothy to understand that you have to know God, how important it is to know God's word. And he's saying, like, how can you know, how can you live for God if you don't understand the basics of who he is and what he expects of his people, right? So that's what he's talking about in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's jump in, verse 14. He says, remind everyone about these things and command them in God's presence to stop fighting over words. Such arguments are useless and they can ruin those who hear them. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. So let's set the scene here. Paul starts out, he says, remind them of these things. Well, what's he talking about? We need some context, right? Well, at the time, there was a heresy called Gnosticism. And among other things, one of the things that they believed is they did not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Paul's telling Timothy, you got to keep reminding people of the truth that our hope is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where our hope is found. But he he gives him a warning. He says, don't fight over words or literally don't engage in word battles because it was true then and you know it's true now, right? Uh, There are always going to be people who want to engage in word play about the Bible and twist and kind of just get the word to say whatever they want it to say. And Paul says, just don't even get in those conversations. It's not worth it. It just misleads people. And in verse 15, he says, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Now, that's in the New Living Translation, which we use here a lot and we really love. But in order to capture the fullness, this verse didn't quite do it. So I'm going to go to the old King James Version. I want you to listen to this description He says it this way, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing the word of truth. So let's break that down. First, he talks about what we should do. He says, study. That's where it all begins. So um, we, we went on vacation. We went to Disney World. We just got back. Anybody gone to Disney World? So, okay. Uh, those of you who haven't, God bless you. That's really smart. Um, But no, there were some great parts. We really liked it. Uh, The beach was just better. But um, we went to Disney World. We went to several different parks. And there are two types of people at Disney. There are tourists and there are explorers. I'm a tourist. My wife, God bless her, is an explorer. Now let me explain the difference. A tourist travels quickly. A tourist has an agenda I got a lot to do. I got a lot to see. We got these rides. We want to go on all this stuff, right? So we stop only to observe the highly noticeable and the public uh, points of interest. Tourists are all about the Disney Fast Pass, right? And as soon as I use a Fast Pass, I'm on my phone getting the next Fast Pass, right? We have the map. We have the app. We're like, let's cut this way, and then we can come back, and then we can hit this, because then we won't miss a thing. That's me. My wife, not so much. Um, My wife is an explorer. Explorers take their time. Explorers want to search out everything that they can find. They don't want to miss a thing. They want to go in every shop and look at every shelf. 
this is my wife. She wants to so deeply experience it all. We're leaving shops and like, I know where everything is in the store. I could do inventory. And, 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 and the guy behind the desk is calling me my name. Like he knows me already. And I'm like, we've been here two hours. We've been on one ride. I'm going to die in this shop, you know, and I'm praying. And uh, that, that's the difference between me and my wife. Now here, here's my point, And there is one actually. Um, too many of us read the Bible like a tourist. Now, we just offered you last week a reading challenge, and that's not a bad thing. It's good. It's a great place, listen, to start. If you haven't been in God's Word, jump into that reading challenge. It's a great place to start. Uh, But if all we ever get to, if we never go any deeper, if all we do is we read a few minutes in the morning, do a daily reading, call it good, move on, and then we go, well, God's Word doesn't have any impact on my life. Paul's saying there's something more than that. He's saying become an explorer dive deep into God's word, wrestle with a verse. What does that mean for my life? How would God have me live differently? How would I have, recognize what he's saying and how would he have me respond to his word? You know, ask yourself questions, uh, figure out scenarios. What, who's speaking? Who are they speaking to? What's the context of the passage? This is why we encourage you to get into an R3 group and, and, and dive deeper into the word. Now, statistics bear this out. There was a study done by the U.S. Department of Labor that uh, people tend to be what they call I-minded. In other words, uh, retention of information increases significantly when you move past just hearing spoken word to actually engaging in reading the text or seeing things. Uh, They found out that 83% of human learning has some sort of a visual element to it. 11% through what we hear. So when you start talking about long-term retention of information, they say that people retain typically 20% of what they hear, 30% of what they see or read, and 50% of what they both hear and see, which means what they study. 50%. So is it any wonder Paul says, hey, we got to not just be like hearing the word or just casually reading. We got to study. We got to get into God's word. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it says, study this book of instruction continually, meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Uh, Meditation is like this lost art of biblical exploration. I think we're scared of this word because it's been like, you know, put with a new age movement or Eastern mysticism and we're like, ooh, that's a little scary. That just shows that we don't understand meditation. Um, Meditation literally means chewing on the Bible. Chewing on the Bible. Uh, Do you know that cows have four stomachs? That's awesome. Uh, They will chew and then swallow and then digest and then regurgitate and chew some more and swallow it into a second stomach and digest and on and on until all the nutrients are are out of the food. Now that's a beautiful, well, it's not a beautiful picture, but it's a picture of meditation. Okay. Richard Foster in his book, Celebration of Discipline says this, Christian meditation very simply is the ability to hear God's voice and obey his word. Like, that's not scary. That's not weird. It's just the ability to hear God's word and obey, uh, to hear his voice and obey his word. Now, let me uh, think of it this way. How many of you, raise of hands, know how to worry? Okay, yeah, like a, a lot of you. Um, if you don't, I'm kind of actually concerned about you. Uh, but uh, I'm actually glad that you know how to worry because if you know how to worry, that means you know how to meditate. Okay, let, let me... Foster goes on in Celebration of Discipline to say this, meditation in Eastern religions is all about emptying your mind, which if we stay there can be really dangerous because of what it could get filled with, right? So it's all about emptying your mind. He says Christian meditation is all about filling your mind with God's truth. So here's the picture. In Eastern religion, you empty your mind and you meditate on nothingness. Now, in real life, we tend to fill that with worry, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to get things done? How, how is this all going to work out, right? Christian meditation is when instead we choose to fill it with God's truth. So that the only thing we really worry about is, God, am I pleasing you? God, is this, is this the decision you would have me make? God, am I following you? Am I going your direction? We, we see this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. It says this, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts or meditate on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Here's the point. Whatever you put in your head controls your life. So we should study this word. 
Second thing, he talks about how we should study. First of all, we should study. And then he says, here's how you should study, to honor God. That's how we should study, to honor God. In Proverbs chapter four, verses four and five, it says this, my father taught me, take my words to heart, follow my commands and you'll live. Get wisdom, develop good judgment, don't forget my words or turn away from them. In other words, you can't honor God and his word if you don't what? Know his word. Does that make sense? You can't honor something you don't know. And I think the reason a lot of people struggle in Christianity is that we know the concepts, but not the truths. We know the concepts. Oh, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus, and he died for my sins, and then he died on the cross, and he rose, and then I go to heaven. And, and those are the concepts. But we don't know the truth that is contained in this book because we've never gotten into it. So there's a picture in this passage of 2 Timothy of an unashamed worker. Now, we all know what it's like to be an ashamed worker. This is when you, uh, you didn't do your best and you totally got busted, right? This is when you didn't really study for the test that much, and then you get your grade, and it looks like you didn't really study for the test that much. This is when you put together that bookshelf, and you sort of follow the instructions, and it's really wobbly, and there's like 10 extra parts, right? This is being busted as an ashamed worker, he says, be an unashamed worker. So let me explain what that looks like. Uh, at the beginning of the summer, I took the basic motorcycle riders course. And they send you a book before the class. And with the book is a note. And the note says, uh, read this book cover to cover, highlight all the answers, you know, and then write page numbers so you can like access, when we get into the class, you can access things quickly. Guess what most people do? They unwrap their book when they get to the class. Okay, but I'm a nerd, so here's what I did. I read the book cover to cover. I highlighted all the answers, and then I wrote the page number, so I was ready. Now, here, there's a reason I did that. The reason I did that is I was scared. Okay, when it came to the motorcycle class, I was not scared of operating the motorcycle. I was not scared of death or physical injury or anything like that. My greatest fear was looking dumb. I didn't want to go in the class and be like, I don't know where the clutch is. I don't know how you shift. I wanted to be ready, right? I, wanted to, I didn't want to be the, the guy who didn't know anything. I think this is our greatest fear when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to the Bible. I think most of us are afraid of what we don't know. And by the way, that's legitimate. According to a recent Gallup poll, they asked a bunch of Christians about the Bible and stuff. 37% of Christians could name all four Gospels. 42% of Christians actually knew five or less of the Ten Commandments. 42% knew who preached the Sermon on the Mount. Now, uh, Barna did a similar poll. Man, so funny. 12% of Christians believe that Joan of Arc is Noah's wife. So I find that interesting. Um, and when they asked Christians this simple question, what is your favorite verse? 75% of Christians in the United States gave the same answer. Do you know what it was? God helps those who help themselves, which isn't even a verse. It's not even in scripture. But 75% of Christians quote, God helps those who help themselves as their favorite verse, which isn't even in the book. So here was Gallup's conclusion. Many Americans revere the Bible, but by and large don't study it. Now, uh, I love how one person puts it. Men do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. Now, compare that to uh, some, some fathers of the faith, some key church figures. John Wesley, uh, upon who, whose teaching our denomination was founded, says, I am a man of one book. John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, said this, I was never out of my Bible. How many of you can say that? I was never out of my Bible. I can't. But listen, if we want to know God more, guess how we find out? We read this book. We study this book. We get to know his word because God reveals himself to us in this book. And he has this way of taking on an intimate role with each of us uniquely as we study it, walking with us through it. It's this divinely inspired book that teaches about God, about how he thinks and, and, and what he values and what pleases and displeases him and, and what he considers wise and unwise. Listen, I'm super excited that you consider the ransom your home. And I'm totally honored that you trust me to teach you the truth. But I want you to test me. 
Okay? Now, I'm teaching the truth, but I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to get in the word so that when you're reading, you can go, oh, yeah, that is what we talked about. Or I understood that a little differently. Let's talk about that. I want you to, to, to get into God's word. Now, listen, this is not saying if you study well, God will love you more. That, that's not what it's saying. A better interpretation is through the study of God's word, we prove our love for him. In other words, it doesn't say that if you study, God will accept you more, and that if you don't study, God will love you less. What it is saying is study makes you more aware of this reality. You're already accepted by God. Study helps you realize, hey, he already loves me. He's already forgiven me. And lack of study makes you less aware of the fact that you're already accepted by God. In other words, we read God's word not to amass information about God, but to get to know the very heart of God. I don't read this book to know more stuff. I read this book to know my Father. That's why I read this book. And guess what? It's hard work. When Paul's writing this, he's standing up in the face of heresy. And in order to, I mean, you want to stand for God's word in this world? Is there anybody going to stand against you? You better believe it. But in order to stand for God's word, we have to know God's word. You know who the most dangerous people in the church are right now? People who listen to a sermon or two on a topic and read a magazine article and then get up on a soapbox and start talking like they know everything about it rather than getting into God's word and studying it for themselves. Which leads to the third part of the equation. Why should we study? Why in the world should we study God's word? And the answer is to know truth. We need to study to know truth. Verse 15 again Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, and I love this phrase, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, that can be translated to cut a straight road. Okay? Uh, it's this picture of handling God's word, cor word correctly, because false teachers, they don't cut a straight road. Now, they don't just straight out lie. They don't tell outright lies. They just distort the truth. They just bend the road a little bit. And this is a call to walk a straight path. It's a, it's a uh, reference to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. You've heard that verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make what? Make your path straight. This is where we get our word orthodox. You hear that word in church? Oh, that's not orthodox. Orthos means right or straight or two, and doxa means opinion. And so the, the orthodox is having a right or straight or true opinion of God and who he is in his word. And as a believer, we're called to live an orthodox life, to live a straight life. To do that demands that we know what he expects of us. And there are tons of things in this world designed to pull us off course. If we're going to live for him, we're going to live intentionally. So the question is, are you living on purpose? Because every one of us will give an account someday for how we handle God's word. And we must handle the word of God honestly. We must handle it fully, not just the verses we like, and truthfully. If we don't do these things, there are tons of dangerous things that can happen. Here's three potential dangers. Uh, three potential dangers of mishandling God's word. Uh, one is taking scripture out of context. Uh, if you read, a, you can read a verse on on a you know. A, a five-minute devotional or needle pointed on a pillow and go, oh, that makes me feel really good inside. But if you don't know the context of that passage, you can make that scripture say whatever you want it to say, can't you? But it was said within a context, and we need, to, we need to let God's word shape us rather than shaping it. Another that's very close to that is teaching the commands of, God, of men in place of the truth of God. Teaching the commands of men in place of the truth of God. That makes us a Pharisee, where we just bend God's word to our will. And then there's believing false teachings that sound like the truth. Listen, if you don't study, if you don't know God's word, you can't stand on truth. You have to take people's word for it. My wife just showed me a thing last night on Facebook. Um, some, some pastor down in Miami, headquartered out of Miami, and he's like in multiple different cities across the United States, multiple different countries, hundreds of thousands of followers. And this guy's telling people he's Jesus. He's telling people... Uh, that you don't need to pray, because I'm right here. You can just send me an email. Uh, he's telling people that, that there's, there's no Satan and there's no sin. Satan's made up by Hollywood, and I don't see you as sinners, and I, I see you as a saint, and I'm God. And he has, he has hundreds of thousands of followers. Because there are people who are just not 
studying the word for themselves. And so they're believing false teachings that sound to them like truth. And all Paul is saying is that's going to go on. You need to live on purpose. Why? So that you don't have to be ashamed. So I, what I'm, what I'm going to say next is if you, don't, if you don't write anything else down, if you don't lock anything else in, lock this in. Shame is not God's intention for you. Okay? Shame is not God's intention for you. When God created Adam and Eve, Scripture says they knew no shame. Shame entered the world when sin entered the world. And according to Romans 3.23, it says all of us have sinned, which means that all of us struggle with shame. All of us have felt shame. And a lot of people avoid this book because we think this is a book of shame. Right? It's just full of rules and regulations telling me all the things I've done wrong. And so we don't read it because we're trying to avoid shame. And the irony is that Jesus, when he died on the cross, took our shame. Do you understand as a believer, you have nothing to be ashamed of? Because the Son of God came and died for you. His blood covers your shame. Paul says, study this book to discover freedom from shame. If you study God's word and you feel condemned, then you're not rightly dividing the word of truth because the word of truth is not, the message of God's word is not a message of shame. It's a message of freedom. In Christ, you have been set free. There is a huge difference between condemnation and conviction. If there's condemnation, you have every reason to be ashamed. But in Christ, there is no condemnation. But there is conviction. There are times when he says, this is the right and the straight and the true path. And if you want to be set free, this is the path. And I just happen to notice, your life's over here. So you're not free. And he will convict us to call us back to that path. And once we understand that we've been set free in Christ, we can rightly divide the word in light of this truth. God, Yes, God will let me be convicted. But there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no shame. So what are you doing with God's word? Let, let me offer you this challenge. And by the way, it's the exact same challenge as last week. I said these were like two sides of a coin, reading and studying God's word. I just want to give you the same challenge. A lot, of, Like hundreds of you signed up for the Bible reading challenge last week. If you didn't, you can still sign up. It's on the Hub Connection. You can just check the box. You don't have to catch up. Just start this week and uh, just start reading for the next. Just immerse yourself in God's Word and just see what He does. Because this book is not a book of shame. It's a book of hope and it's a book of freedom. So let me pray for you. So Heavenly Father, there, there are people in this room who do not know you. And they heard today that there's freedom in your son. And I, I, I pray that that, I pray that their spirits are longing for that. And then there are others in this room who would say that they know you, they prayed a prayer, they accepted Christ as their savior, but they still don't feel free. God, if, if there are those people in both of those situations, they just need to see Jesus. Would you come into my life? Would you be Lord of my heart? Would you change me from the inside out? And God, when we do that, you start us on a journey, but then what you do is you hand us an instruction guide. How to be set free for dummies. <laughs> you give us your word. And within these words is life and freedom and joy and hope. And yes, conviction to get us on the right path. But there is no condemnation in these words. So whatever fear we've had of engaging your word, would you take that away? And would you give us the courage to check the box and say, today I accepted Christ as my Savior, or today I, I uh, want to start the Bible reading challenge, or whatever it is. And, and would you help us to have the courage to begin to access your word and find the hope and the joy and the freedom that you would have for us? I pray this in your name. Amen. Well, we're so excited that you decided to learn and grow with us today. If the challenge at the end of the message struck a chord in your heart and you would like to respond but were unable to because you were online, 
We'd love to have you contact us at info at the ransomchurch.org. We would love to give you more information on how you can not only respond to the call, but also how you can get more involved at the Ransom Church. Thanks and God bless. Well, we're so excited that you joined us today on our online campus. Even though we believe there's no replacement for the fellowship of the body, we understand that there are circumstances that might keep you from being with us at one of our physical locations today. We hope you'll consider joining us in person in the future. If you'd like more information on how to be involved in the Ransom Church, that will be available after this teaching time. But for now, just enjoy the message.